We're here with Don Marcus, former Terp sports writer with the Baltimore Sun. Don, you've interacted with Lefty and Gary and, and Turge and all of them. Uh, what are your best recollections of one Charles Grice Lefty Drizel? When did you first meet up with him? Oh, that's an interesting story because I, I, the first contact I had with him, uh, I, I covered him one game. Uh, it, it didn't turn out too well for Maryland. I covered the uh, uh, for working Newsday on Long Island. I covered the, um, the game between Georgetown and Maryland in the in nineteen. I think it was nineteen eighty. Game in Philadelphia, and uh, that 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 was you know recollection of that game is that Albert King had a really big first half and didn't see the ball very much because Ernie Graham decided that he wanted to win the game by himself and uh, left the uh, that's the first time I heard the I know you know I know uh, line about something about Ernie and and Ernie became a friend of mine and I love Ernie and Jonathan and had great memories of, of dealing with them with the son but really the first time I con get, came in contact with Lefty is uh, was when I was on the beat I had been hired in the in February of uh, 1985 I sort of covered national colleges in Georgetown before I moved down to, to uh, Maryland to specifically cover the Terps and um, I hadn't met him yet, and uh, so I I tried to. Uh, oh, there was a story in the there was a story in the um, I think it was in the Norfolk paper about how they were. Uh, he was he was being considered to coach at uh, at ODU at in Norfolk, being his hometown, and uh, so. I called him up. It's you know August. I was at the PGA Championship in Denver. I called him up, and he. I'll I'll I'll, I'll give I'll, I'll give your re, your listeners uh, a, 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 a my impression of Lefty. And I I called him up, and I said I was Don Marcus from the Baltimore, and I didn't even get to the son. He said, "Son, I'm on vacation," and I hung up. So as the reporters do, they don't take no for an answer. I called him up again, and I just he just heard the sound of my voice, and he said, I told you I was on vacation, click. So I said, all right, this is not going to happen. And I just wrote that he declined comment. Well, a few weeks later, I'm interviewing Dick Dull in his office, and I never even told Dick the story of my, my, my meeting, my, my conversation, if you can call it that, with Lefty. And we're coming out of his office, and he said, oh, let me, you know, I said, have you met Lefty yet? And I gave him an honest answer. I said, no. He says, oh, let me bring you into his office. And he knocks on the door. And he uh, and he says, uh, Coach, I want you to meet the new beat writer for the Baltimore Sun. And uh, Lefty saw me. And, and he said, Don Marcus. And he saw me. And he didn't even, I didn't say a word. He apologized. He said, I was on vacation. I'm sorry about that. What do you need? That was the start of what was a very interesting year uh, covering him, a very memorable year for many reasons. Uh, sadly, a tragic year at the end of it with the uh, with the death of um, Glenn Bias and right after the season was over, right after the NBA draft, and then the ultimate uh, resignation, forced resignation of Lefty. Uh, and I believe it was October by the time that everything was straightened out. But... That one year was very memorable. I think I've told you and I've told other people that um, I don't think I spent any, I don't think I've got, I don't think I have uh, more memorable lines and interviews and everything from one year of Lefty than all the years I covered Gary, Turgeon, Bob Wade, and, and other people combined. He was just a very uh, unforgettable character. We had, you know, we, as, as often happens and as should happen with reporters, uh, it was an adversarial relationship, and most of the time it was friendly, and other times it was not. And, uh, but you know, I, I, I mean, I, I just sent a text to Chuck, uh, who I got to know because I didn't really cover him, and he was great in, in my relationship and helping 
helped me sort of navigate my relationship with his father because uh, it could be difficult. And um, and I sent him a, you know, and I, and I said, you know, to quote your dad, uh, I know you know I love your dad. And that's how I ended the text. So he thanked me, and you know, I I'll, I told him if you ever wanted to hear all the stories, give me give me a call because there are plenty of them. Don, that is Don, that was a fantastic. great story. You know, we, we've spoken about things like this for, for many years. And you had one other just fantastic recollection of a game that I guess took place at the Dean Dome. Can you let our listeners in on what happened there? Sure. Well, when you mention that, I'm sure your listeners know what, know, know what game we're talking about. I mean, there were memory, many memorable games down there. You know, with you know, Gary Williams had had, had his share, um, but the uh, even even Turgeon had a couple of games down there. That were, but uh, the game was then uh, with all Maryland fans and with those who covered it was the game in um, in the you know the, I guess it must have been February of of uh, January February of eight, 1986. You know, Maryland started that year 0-5, I believe, in the ACC, and uh, really weren't playing well. And uh, I, I had written a, a like a lead to a notes column after they lost earlier in the year to Villanova, uh, and talked to Pete Carlesimo, PJ's dad, who was the head of the NIT, and then weathered Maryland with a terrible, not a very good record. I think they were like 13-10 at that point. And maybe they had won a game in the ACC, I don't even remember. Would, would, would they even make the NIT that year? He said, maybe not. Probably not. I hope I don't get their act together. So, you know, they won. They had won at NC State. And then um, Glenn and, and Jeff Johnson had suspended for breaking curfew that night. And they go ahead and lose down to Clemson. They come back. They win a home game, non conference game. And then they're playing Carolina. I believe number one in the country. First year of the Dean Dome. Had not, the Tar Heels had not lost the game there. And they were pretty big underdogs, obviously. And uh, and Maryland goes down there and, and stays in the game and wins the game in, in overtime, uh, I believe. And Len has 35 points. He has the famous uh, reverse dunk. Keith Gatlin throws the ball up. Kenny Smith's back his leg, and they score a layup, basically seal the game. And in those days, it was difficult enough getting stories in with pretty what is now uh, rudimentary uh, software, and uh, so you, you, you know, it was a tough process on normal normal game. And I I was late getting down. In fact, I missed the press conference uh, completely. And I get down there, and Lefty's waiting waiting for me. And I said, "Where were you?" And he said, "I had transmission from." And he said, "What'd you drive a car on here?" And then he so, said, "So you one mean of the great lines of all, all time?" He says, "You think we'll make the NIT now?" So when you yeah. say transmission problems, you meant that you were trying to send the game story in. Yeah, yeah, I'm sending the game story. I, I did not drive my car into the Dean Dome. No, that did not happen. But <laughs> uh, but then you know, and, and then they went on, and they were you know, and this is sort of a a season long harangue between E and I. And friendly, you know, I always said that Lefty could, you know, give it, give it to you, and the next day he'd forget about it, that he, you know, gave you a hard time. And uh, so they, they, they get their act together, and they, but they're a bubble team at the end of the year, and going into the last home game of the season, senior day for Len Bias, uh, with the, uh, you know, they're playing Virginia at home, rival, big rivalry, and. Uh, and and I called Dick Schultz because they were they were really you know not not a lot to get in the tournament. I think they were five and eight and, going to that game in the league. And Dick Schultz and, is the head of the head of the selection committee. Well, Dick Schultz is the AD of Virginia. Let's okay. leave it at that for now. But I'll tell you the story. So I go to Lefty and I said uh, I said uh, you know I talked to Dick Schultz and you guys are going to have to beat them to really get in the picture for the NCAA and. and Lefty said, "What does he know? He's a he's a AD in Virginia." I said, "Well, he's also the head of the selection committee." And he said, "Well, if we don't get in, it'll be the biggest ripoff since the Louisiana Purchase." <laughs> and that could be that could be all 
all-time, that could be one of the all-time quotes I've ever, I ever got from anybody in my career. That's uh, right. You know, and they, you know, they, they got in, they, they lost to, um, they lost to uh, UNLV in, uh, in Long Beach, and uh, it was la- that was the last time Len Bias played in a, in a organized basketball game, because uh, three months later, he was dead. Yeah. Now, those were some great times, and Lefty certainly was the king of the court, and Bruce Bruce Posner brought up, they used to play Hail the Chief when he walked out. It was that big a deal. So, it's a, a beyond life-size, out, out, an outsized personality that you just don't see that much anymore, and as you said, if that was your all-time favorite cover? Was covering lefty? Yeah, I, I would say for covering a, you know, I covered. I mean, listen, I covered Tiger Woods' first ten majors, and I covered, you know, I covered some really iconic events. You know, covering golf, covering college football, covering covering college basketball, even covering the NBA. But as far as an individual, um, I mean, I covered Luke on a second for years in, in New York, and he had some memorable lines too. We had, we had some great back and forth, but nothing like Lefty because Louie was such a sweet guy. Um, and he never went after writers like Lefty did. And I was I I, I, I felt like I was you know John Feinstein had gotten off the beat. So uh, you know for the Washington Post, so I think I, I just followed John as sort of the uh, as far as the guy from the, the New Yorker with who, who who pushed him a little and he pushed back and had a great relationship and John wrote a terrific piece in the post about his own recollections of being with you know, with Lefty talking to Lefty over the years. And uh, yeah, it was it was I, I would have to say, just in terms of good copy, great interaction and uh, and, and just memorable, you know, conversations. Some good, some were pretty one sided him yelling at me. Um you know, I would have to say he's, he's, he's right at the top. All right. Don, thanks for joining in and sharing your recollections. That is Don Marcus, formerly of the Baltimore Sun. I'm Wayne Viner, and we will be back hopefully later in the week with a few more stories from Don and maybe another special guest. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you soon. <laughs> Thank you.